Well, welcome to worship here at Woodbury Lutheran Church and our online campus. This is it. This is what church looks like for us in the next few weeks as we continue to to work our way through 2020 and deal with a worldwide pandemic. Uh, We have uh, suspended our in-person worship services for the next week or so, uh, and we are providing you worship here online here at Woodbury Lutheran Church and live.woodburylutheran.org. Well, one of the benefits of being able to worship here online is that we still get to worship, that we still have this way of getting together, uh, though we are in a lot of different places and spread out in a lot of different areas, we get to still come together as the body of Christ and, and worship our Lord and Savior. And that is an awesome, awesome thing. So we ask you today to, to join us in worship. And what an easier way to be able to invite someone to worship than by simply clicking a button. Our online service hosts are going to put that link into the chat right now, and you can invite someone to join us here in worship as we come together and worship as a congregation here today. Speaking of that, if you are a guest with us, we would love to get to know you a little bit better. There's a button at the top of your screen where you can click uh, to connect with us, and we'd love to just get to know you a little bit more, learn a little bit more about you, and thank you for being with us here today as well. Uh, We invite you to use all of the different functions that we have here during our live worship. The chat chat box is going to be filled with a bunch of different kinds of links. Our Our online service hosts are going to be able to help you and walk you through the service through doing that. You can request prayer at the bottom of the screen or or simply click that little heart button to, uh, if you're so moved in that way as well. And one of the ways that it can be easier for us to get into and engage in worship as we worship online here is to be able uh, to create an account. You can create an account with us at live.woodburylutheran.org and it makes it just easier to get involved and get started in worship when the time comes for that. Now today we are celebrating communion as well. So we want to invite you to prepare the space that you are worshiping in, uh, whatever that looks like, wherever you might be. Prepare the space, uh, eliminate distractions, but also take a moment now to go and get the communion elements, bread and wine, and bring them uh, to wherever you're worshiping so that when we get to celebrate communion together and come together as a body of believers in that way, that we're ready to do so. With all that said, all that instruction, let's get to it. Our online worship starts right now. spoke a word you were singing over me and you've been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me and you've been so so kind
ride up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me The snow wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Welcome to worship. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Dean Donovan, and I'm the campus pastor of our Oak Hill campus, and it is a blessing for me to be with you today. We are in our second week of our sermon series entitled Homesick. Today, Pastor Tom Fotenhauer is going to be sharing with us an incredible, encouraging word, um, convicting and strengthening for you, and so I'm excited for you to hear that word today. We begin our worship today following the triune God. And so we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our lesson today, our first lesson, comes from the Gospel of Luke. It begins in verse 13. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am, dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please, take me on as a hired servant. This is the gospel of the Lord. Father, draw us back to you. Amen. As we enter into a time of, of confession, what a, what a powerful piece of scripture where the son finds himself in a distant land, broken and alone, starving, hungry for, for what his father could provide. We find ourselves in that same place, all of us, in need, in want, desperate to return home to the father. And so at this time, would you pray with me as we confess our need and our desperation to return home back to our good 
Father. Almighty God, we thank you that you see us in our desperation, just as we see this son in his desperation, squandering what what the Father had given to him. And yet, in his brokenness, seeing his need to come home, to come back to his Father. And so, Almighty God, we confess to you that we have squandered what you have given. We've been selfish with what you have been, what you have given to us. And so, Lord God, as we confess our sin to you, we trust and know that you, our Heavenly Father, welcome us home with open arms, reconciling us, giving us hope, giving us forgiveness, and providing for us in every way. So thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for this good, good gift that you have given to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing and let's celebrate that mercy of God.
Thanks be to God for the great mercy that he has shown us. And he shows us that mercy in so many different ways, ways that are, that are real and tangible for us to see and to understand here. Uh, for over 30 years, the Christian cupboard has been op- had operated out of our Valley Creek campus here at Woodbury Lutheran Church. And about 15 years ago, one of our members, Lori Nixon, had a dream for how we could reach more people uh, through, through a similar type of way in, in uh, clothes. And so she started the organization called the Christian Closet. And the Christian Closet blessed over thousands and thousands of people over the years with clothes that made interviews possible, clothes that made children warm. In more recent years, Gloria Johnson has taken over that ministry and, and many countless volunteers throughout the year that we are so thankful that for the time and the effort that they have put into it. Now, as we close that chapter of, of the Christian Closet, we thank God for new and exciting things that we can do in ministry as we continue to, to be on mission with the Father in that way. As we take up our offerings today, there is many different ways that you can give. You can scan the QR code that you see on the bottom of the screen or text to give. Our online worship uh, service host will put uh, a link into the chat. You can go to our website at woodburylutheran.org to get more information about giving. And of course, you can always send us a check here at our Valley Creek campus and our main office at 7380 Afton Road, Woodbury, Minnesota, 55. One, two, five. Whatever way you have chosen to give, whatever way you have uh, decided to support this ministry, we want to thank you. And, and with Thanksgiving coming up here in the next week, uh, we want to also make you aware of our uh, Thanksgiving service that we are going to be having as well. Thanksgiving service this year is going to be a little different. It'll be online, uh, but we invite you to join us at two different times, either on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. or Thursday morning at 9 a.m., uh, join us to be, uh, to be closer to Jesus in this incomprehensible peace that we experience with him. Let's come together and worship him in that way at that time. And at this time, we go to God with thanksgiving in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the mercy that you have shown us We thank you for the peace that you have have given to us in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for allowing us to be your children, for loving us in ways uh, that are incomprehensible. God, as we continue to to move uh, through this year, which is so difficult and has so many things that are happening, disease running rampant, unrest uh, in Ethiopia, and so many other different things that we are are dealing with as a congregation. We pray that you would continue to to guide us and to lead us. Be with our church staff and our leadership, our pastoral team, as we continue to try to figure out exactly the right way that you would love us to lead at this time. No answers are easy. Everything seems difficult. And so, God, we trust your guidance. We trust your love and your provision for our lives that we continue to follow after you. God, we know that your will is good. We know that you have the, the best needs of ours in mind. And we know that you will work those things together for our good as your disciples. So Father, help us to understand that. Help us to continue to move toward that. And help us to continue to be disciples of Christ. And as we continue to shape and mold our lives after your Son, We pray the words that he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
I invite you now to speak the words of the Apostles' Creed, these words that unify us as disciples of Jesus. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. As we move into a time of fellowship, in sharing, in communion today, I would invite you to um, get the elements, the bread and the wine, ready uh, at this time. As we prepare our hearts to receive Christ's body and blood, I would invite you to speak these words, the very words of Jesus, with me. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat, body of Christ broken for you. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink, blood of Christ shed for you. And now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in the one true faith to life everlasting. If there are other members of your family or friends with you at this time, um, they can commune as well. If you've not been instructed in this gift, um, you can simply give one another a blessing at this time, speaking these words. May the Lord bless you and strengthen you in your faith. to 
What a privilege to celebrate Holy Communion with one another, to be encouraged and strengthened uh, for these really hard days that we're walking through. Kids, it is time to head off to Kids Link. This is for those of you who are up to about fifth grade. You know the drill. Take out your device, point it at the QR code, and that will get you exactly where you need to go. Uh, For the rest of you, we are going to be looking at a text from Jeremiah and actually jumping around a little bit today as we continue in this homesick series. And so I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah, an Old Testament prophet. I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, Chapter 25, the first 14 verses. This message for all the people of Judah came to Jeremiah from the Lord during the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign over Judah. This was the year when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon began his reign. Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people in Judah and Jerusalem, For the past 23 years... From the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until now, the Lord has been giving me his messages. I have faithfully passed them on to you, but you have not listened. 
Again and again, the Lord has sent you his servants, the prophets, but you have not listened or even paid attention. Each time the message was this, turn from the evil road you are traveling and from the evil things you are doing. Only then will I let you live in this land that the Lord gave to you and your ancestors forever. Do not provoke my anger by worshiping idols you made with your own hands. Then I will not harm you. But you would not listen to me, says the Lord. You made me furious by worshiping idols you made with your own hands, bringing on yourselves all the disasters you now suffer. And now because the Lord of heaven's armies says, because you have not listened to me, I will gather together all the armies of the north under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, whom I have appointed as my deputy. I will bring them all against this land and its people and against the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy you and make you an object of horror and contempt and a ruin forever. I will take away your happy singing and laughter. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard. Your millstones will fall silent and the lights in your homes will go out. This entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then after the 70 years of captivity are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland forever. I will bring upon them all the terrors I have promised in this book, all the penalties announced by Jeremiah against the nations. Many nations and great kings will enslave the Babylonians just as they enslaved my people. I will punish them in proportion to the suffering they cause my people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And like last week when Dean read those words from Number, he was kind of left in in shock. And I feel uh, the same way as we look at those words from Jeremiah. Uh, If you were with us last weekend, Dean kicked off this homesick series. And as he uh, kicked off this homesick series, uh, we, we met the Israelites as they were out traveling in the wilderness. Uh, God had freed them from their captivity, their slavery in Egypt, and now they were on their way to the promised land. But how quickly they forgot all that God had done for them. And we found them grumbling in the wilderness saying, we want to go back to Egypt even though they had been slaves there for more than 400 years. You see, the challenge of their present made them look at their past in a very distorted way. The challenge of their present made them look at their past in a very distorted way. Well, today we meet the Israelites again. Except this time, they're not on their way to the promised land. Instead, they're being exiled away from the promised land to the kingdom of Babylon. And yet it's so interesting that in in the midst of that exile, God isn't saying to them, I want you to, to think about coming back home. But what he's saying to them is that through this time, I'm going to offer you new beginnings. New beginnings. Now, we're not wanting to go back to Egypt or even to, to the promised land. But wow, this time in life is hard and, and we want to go, go back to the way it was. But I wonder, what if, what if God is showing us an opportunity for new beginnings? What if it's more than just about looking back to the past or going back to what was, but if it's looking to see the new things that God will do both in our lives individually and in our life as a church? When I was a kid, I hated going to sleepovers. And I hated going to sleepovers because I would always get homesick. And it would start the same way, kind of a stomach ache, and then I would feel it in my throat. And I remember one time when I was maybe seven or eight, I was over at my friend's uh, Ross's house for a sleepover, and it, it all started the, the same way, and I was convinced that I was going to throw up, and so, you know, I made Ross's mom call my mom to come and pick me up, so my mom comes and pick me, picks me up, and I guess I should have toughed it up, because when I got home, my mom had to break the news that my dog uh, got to my hamster. The hamster was rolling around in its little ball, and it somehow opened up the ball, and the hamster must have had a heart attack and fear or whatever, so my hamster died. It was a 
a rough night. And as we think about this year and how hard it is, we just want to go back to normal. We wish we could go back there. And and trust me, I get it. I get it. I haven't been in a restaurant for 10 months. I'm tired of people being looked at like they're a leper if they have the audacity to sneeze. It's crazy what's going on around us. And like the Israelites in the desert, our, our, our present challenges can make us look back at the past with a distorted view because more often than not, the past had enough problems of its own. There's a dead hamster waiting for us, not the glorious time we make it out to be. So the, the question is, how can we move forward in this time? How can we see God doing new things, giving us opportunities for new beginnings? And I believe uh, that the scripture we have in store for us will help us to get there. Uh, we heard about it in Jeremiah 25, I, I read to you a moment ago. And it's this precursor to the Israelites being taken off into what's known as the Babylonian captivity. And it's even more specific than that. This is actually the kingdom of Judah. And I don't have time to get into this, but, but Israel, after they went into the promised land, the two kingdoms got divided, the northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. And for the most part, they had really bad kings. And their kings led them away from God again and again and again. And so Jeremiah had the unenviable task of calling the people of Jerusalem and Judah back to God. And you you heard that in the reading. He said, man, I've been doing this for 20 some years. Over and over and over. I'm telling you, you got to repent. Turn from your evil ways. Once again, follow God. The same God who rescued you from Egypt, brought you through the Red Sea on dry land, provided for you in the desert for 40 years. Come and follow this God. And over and over again, they refuse to listen. And it gets rough for Jeremiah. Jeremiah is this this great prophet, but he had issues. He dealt with depression and anxiety. He even got thrown into a cistern for trying to do the right thing. So they refuse to listen. And Jeremiah says, fine, have it your way. If you're not going to listen to me, here's what the Lord says. King Nebuchadnezzar is going to take you into captivity for 70 years. And that's exactly what, what happens. Nebuchadnezzar comes in, uh, destroys Jerusalem, and does something interesting. He doesn't bring everybody back uh, with him to Babylon. He only brings the best of Israel, the, the brightest and the leaders and the influencers. So people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you want to destroy a culture, you take all the very best people. And so he brings all the very best people with him back to Babylon. And fast forward then four chapters later to chapter 29. We we heard these words uh, a couple weeks ago. Jeremiah has a message for the people who've been exiled. But it's a strange message. It's not a a care package. Hey, I hope you're doing well. You're going to be getting home soon. But it's a direct word from God about what he wants to do in the midst of their exile. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Notice it's God who has exiled them. Nebuchadnezzar is his instrument. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Find spouses for them so that they have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. And work for the peace of And prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. For its welfare will determine your welfare. You see, God knew that his people would get homesick. He knew that they would want to get back to normal. But instead, the Lord says, no, I'm going to use this time to transform you. To move you away from those people who who quit listening to me. To those who will follow me. With everything. And so I want you to to plant gardens. I want you to plan on staying. I want you to build homes. I want you to marry and not to to synthesize into the culture, but do that so that you can transform the culture. I'm going to do something new through this exile. 
Well, as followers of Jesus, we are living in exile right now. The United States of America used to be considered a Christian culture. Uh, No longer. We are now living in a post-Christian world. Here's what this means. It means that for many years, we as Christians, we held the high ground in culture. And so it meant that if people weren't sold out on Jesus, they still kind of went through the motions. You know, maybe went to church and prayed at dinner or whatever. And, and at the very least, they were not antagonistic toward Christianity. And boy, has that shifted. Uh, take, for example, the idea of biblical marriage between a man and a woman. 25 years ago, more than 65% of Americans said, yeah, that's right, that's how it should be. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Today, that percentage is less than 20. And if you're in that 20%, then you are considered by many to be hateful and bigoted. Take, for example, the teaching that Jesus alone is the way to salvation. If you hold that to be true, then you are intolerant. And so as we continue to live in exile, and as that exile grows and grows and grows, how can we plant gardens? How can we build homes? How can we continue to bring transformation to the culture and not be transformed by the culture? How do we lean into this? How do we lean into this and believe Believe the truth that God will not waste. God will not waste this time. Because i got to tell you, there is danger in looking back. There is great danger in looking back. Uh, Susan Matt, she is a, a historian who, who studies this stuff, studies what it looks like to, to, be, to be gazing back. Uh, she calls it nostalgia. And, and here's what she has to say. In society at large, Nostalgia can distort our understanding of the world in dangerous ways, making us needlessly negative about our current situation. Woe is me. And that's not to say that our current situation isn't difficult. It is. But if we just get caught looking for the good old days, wanting things to go back to normal, we will miss out on what God is doing right now. This is really interesting. Uh, During the Civil War, there were about 6,000 Union soldiers who were diagnosed with homesickness or nostalgia. And believe it or not, there are 74 recorded deaths by nostalgia. The army bands weren't allowed to play the the song, Home Sweet Home. Pastors and leaders wouldn't talk about going home at fear that another outbreak would happen. And so in the midst of that, how, how do we find hope? In the midst of our own desire to go back to normal, in the midst of the brokenness and the challenges, and they are many all around us, how do we how do we move forward? And I believe it's this. It's the belief that God will absolutely not waste this time. That as we can't see it, and even when it's not right there in front of us, when we're not feeling it, God is working. God is working. And this belief that he will not waste this time for us individually and us as a church will help to shape those new beginnings for us as we look forward. See, that's exactly what happened to Israel for 70 years. For 70 years, there they were, exiled, filed away, couldn't get home, trying to figure out what the new normal was. But during that time, Israel was shaped for genuine growth. For genuine growth. And it it led to, to three things. First, it led to this new identity. It's pretty interesting that as the Israelites left exile after 70 years, just as God had promised, I mean, talk about a prophecy, right? They went away for 70, and then they were given their freedom. And and, and they went different places after uh, the exile was over. I'll get to that in a moment. But as they went to different places, they all had a new identity. 
Uh, for the first time, they were no longer known as, as Hebrews, but for the first time, they were known as, as Jews. They were given a new identity that they brought with them back out into the world. And this new identity, it was built on this incredible, incredible revival that happened within, within the Jewish uh, people. And specifically, there was revival in, in worship. And so lots of you, you know this, but when they were living in Judah, in Jerusalem, the temple was where God was, was located. And so if you wanted to worship, you had to go to the temple. And you had to offer sacrifices in the temple. And you had to do all the right rituals and all the right things in the temple to make sure that you were okay with God. Because that's where he was, was present. But now here they are in Babylon. And guess what's not in Babylon? The temple. So how, how are they going to worship? How are they going to offer sacrifice? Well, they had to get, to, to get innovative. And they got innovative in a bunch of ways. Instead of going to the temple, which they couldn't do, it was destroyed, uh, they started to worship in homes with one another. Sound familiar? Uh, so they started to gather in, in smaller synagogues, we would call them, Today they, they gathered around at, at rivers. They gathered in open fields. It reminds me of our worship this summer in our parking lots and in a big open field and online and in person. They had to innovate how they were going to come into the presence of God. And as they did that, all the ornateness of the temple was replaced with simplicity. It was like God was stripping away all that stuff and all those rituals that were meant for good but that now got in the way. And there was a renewed focus on Scripture instead of all the, 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 the rituals that had become so, so empty. And in the midst of that, God was, was doing something new. He was shaping these, these people who refused to listen to Jeremiah. And he was bringing about revival. A revival that would give them strength to plant gardens and to build homes and to transform the culture they were living in instead of being transformed by it. And then God does something spectacular. Because Judaism wasn't tethered to one central place in the temple, it spread. And a movement of growth began. The spread of Judaism. How does that happen, you ask? Well, after the exile was over, instead of everybody going back to Jerusalem, some people stayed, a few went to, to Jerusalem, but archaeological studies have shown that most of those who were exiled, they went to northern Israel and to Lebanon and to Syria. And some even went to Iraq and to Iran and to Georgia, not the state the country. There are people in those nations today that can trace their ancestry all the way back to these exiles. You see that? They went. They went and they brought this transformation they had received by coming into the presence of God along with them. And then something incredible happens. A few hundred years later, Jesus of Nazareth is crucified and he rises from the dead. Hopefully you've, you've heard this proclaimed before. And for 40 days, Jesus appears to his followers, at one point to more than 500 witnesses who, who saw Jesus dead and now see him alive again. And after 40 days, he ascends to be with his Father. And then the day of Pentecost happens. And do you remember who was there? On the day of Pentecost. Listen to these words from, from Acts chapter 2. And at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation staying in Jerusalem. These were ancestors of those who were exiled. Here God brings all of them together. And on the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit is given. That's the loud noise. And, and they all come running. And they were bewildered. Don't you love that word? To hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. 
And Peter goes on and he, he gives the gospel about what Jesus has done. And we're told that 3,000 of them were cut to the heart that day and they were, they were baptized. Ancestors of those who were exiled. Now they go back to their homes, bringing with them the message of Jesus. And this movement is born and it spreads, it spreads around the world. And so we do, believe, do we believe that God will not waste this time in our lives? That it's time to, to stop looking back at the past and glorifying the past? That it's time to, to stop being afraid about what's going to happen to the church? The church will be okay. That's Jesus promise. It might look different, but it's going to be okay. Instead, maybe it's, it's time to believe, to believe that, that God's not going to waste this time, that he is going to do something new, even in the midst of the challenge and the heart. And that happens, that happens as we come back into the presence of God. That's what's brought about transformation for the people of Judah as they were in Babylon. And, and we see this in the reading that we had earlier about the prodigal son, the lost son. In the midst of, of the mess, in the midst of the challenge, he, he realizes what, what home is. And home is, is more than just a place for him, but it's being in the presence of his father. And so he says, I don't care how badly I've messed up. I don't care how much I've sinned. I've got to go back to my Father. Because that's where change happens. That's where renewal happens. That's where forgiveness happens. And so he goes back to his Father. And he confesses his sin both against him and against his Father in heaven. And he says, I don't deserve anything. What does his Father do? His Father runs out to greet him. And he's got rings and fatted calves and big robes for him. And he says, the Son of mine who was lost is found. He is home. You see that young man? He was exiled, but not extinguished. And so it is for us. As we walk through these challenging days, what are the new things that God is going to do who knows? Maybe we'll have a new name that fits the, the mission and direction that God is giving to us in this next season of ministry. I don't know. Maybe there will be revival amongst God's people. A revival that brings about transformation that leads us to understand we don't just gather, but we scatter back out into the brokenness of this world. Like those first exiles, what if, what if God sends some of us to a, a new campus here and, and helps us to revive a, a, another church over here and helps us to serve in a ministry there and, and plants us in our neighborhoods to bring about transformation in those places? We may be exiled, but as long as Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives, we are not extinguished. And we will not give up. And we will not stop fighting for the grace and the truth that Jesus Christ alone could bring into our lives. We're invited to be like that lost son. To go home into the presence of our Father. To find everything that we need with Him. So that... In the midst of our exile, we have incredible hope that God will not waste this time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus into this broken world to live the life that we could never live, to sacrifice himself that we might find newness of life. 
And as we live as exiles in this world, give us strength, give us courage, give us wisdom, fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would not be transformed by the culture, but that we would bring transformation to it. All for your glory, we pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Tom, for that uh, beautiful message. Well, you're invited to take that message deeper. Uh, We have scripture cards that we put together that are designed specifically to follow along with our sermon series. You can uh, can get this, not physically right now, but you can get it through our QR code, which you'll see uh, pop up on your screen there. Just simply scan that QR code, and it'll bring you right to the place that you need to go to be in the Word and to continue to engage in that way as well. We invite you to come back. Uh, We have two opportunities, actually, this week to be uh, back in worship and to continue to take it deeper. Uh, First of all, we have our Thanksgiving service. It's a little different this year, obviously. We're going to be online, uh, but we're putting uh, together a specific service which talks about incomprehensible peace, the peace which Jesus gives us, uh, the peace which we continually get to go back to. And so there's two opportunities for us to go back to that source of peace this week. For our Thanksgiving service, you can join us either at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night or at 9 a.m. on Thursday morning. Uh, And then we also invite you to to come back on Sunday. Next week, we are having another online worship experience, online only on the 29th. So you can join us at live.woodburylutheran again, right here where we're at now. But as we go, take the blessing of the Lord as you go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.
feel it in my bones, you're about to move I feel it in the wind, you're about to ride You said that you would pour your spirit out You said that you would fall on sons and daughters So come
heart.